the sights and sounds of the burbs. Mowers, blowers, whackers, weeders, and that sterile, still silence of well-kept turf. When you look out your window, nothing moves. This does not bother you because you grew up with a yard in which nothing moved. You think a yard with little to no animal life is normal. After all, animals belong in nature, and nature is someplace else. What's more, the local civic or homeowner association has passed rules suggesting that building landscapes that do not support wildlife is good land stewardship. Listen and look carefully. Warblers? No. Monarchs? Never. Bees? Well... No noise! Suggests no bees. While we like to imagine that we can survive in worlds without thriving plant or animal life, we sadly cannot. There has been growing awareness in the West about the importance of pollinators, but surveying the landscapes of our cities and towns, it's apparent that this hasn't translated into adequate action. We are living through the sixth mass extinction, with prominent biologists arguing that we need to conserve 50% of the Earth in connected protected areas. I've talked about the implications of this plan elsewhere, but while people generally understand that habitat fragmentation is bad, we still tend to ignore lawns, the spaces right outside our front doors, as sites that contribute greatly to it. We also ignore lawns as sites of potential transformation. Of course, we'll need political economic system change to address climate breakdown and biodiversity loss, and as a renter, you may have little to no say about what happens outside your door. But turning these aesthetically pleasing but ecologically barren wastelands into generative, connected landscapes and wildlife corridors could be key to preserving what we have left and reviving some of what we've lost. So I'll lay my plea to you up front, please, for the love of all things living, kill your lawn. It's a funny thing how we all became lawn people, dutifully pushing heavy gas-guzzling mowers in the hot sun and spraying carcinogens all over where our kids play. Turf grass has replaced diverse native plant communities with tens of millions of acres in the U.S. alone, with that acreage ballooning each year. In many states, turf grass takes up an area that more than doubles the area allocated to state and national parks, state forests, and wildlife management areas. On individual lots, it's common for 90% of the available landscape to be dedicated to lawn. With so much space covered in turf, lawn people are then compelled to act in ways mediated by the requirements of maintaining a particular aesthetic. And these requirements are immense. Let's look at the numbers. In the U.S., lawn irrigation consumes on average more than 8 billion gallons of water daily. This accounts for 30% of all water used during the summer in the East and up to 60% in the West. That's 32 gallons per day per person in the country. This is more water than is replaced by rainfall in most areas, making this entirely unsustainable. Keeping the turf quote-unquote weed-free is also a toxic endeavor. 40% of the chemicals used in the lawn care industry in the U.S. are banned in other countries because they are carcinogens. There are dozens of studies documenting the connection between lawn pesticides and lymphoma. Rachel Carson's famous Silent Spring, which is credited for inspiring the Western environmental movement, warned us of the pervasive impacts of these chemicals way back in 1962, and yet the lawn care industry has only skyrocketed to a multi-billion dollar industry since then. Homeowners also put roughly the same amount of fertilizer on their lawns as is used in big agriculture. 40-60% to 60 of fertilizer applied to lawns ends up in surface and groundwater, where it kills aquatic organisms and contaminates drinking water. In Lawn People, political ecologist Paul Robbins found that people who use chemicals to maintain their lawns tend to think that these chemicals have a negative environmental impact, particularly on local water quality, and yet they do it anyway. 
According to the EPA, Americans spend more than 3 billion collective hours per year maintaining their lawns and feeding the massive and mega-profitable lawn economy, pulverizing habitat and toxifying our surroundings. What on earth has driven this nonsensical behavior? Well, Robbins argues that lawn people are the result of both a moral and political economy. Our story begins with the early colonial capitalists and their ideals. Lawns originated in the 1500s in Europe as aesthetic managed gardens. As geographer Becky Ellis notes, these were very distinct from commonly managed land, which tended to consist of meadows for livestock grazing or forests for foraging. Lawns grew in popularity among the British aristocracy throughout the enclosure of the commons, where peasants were forcefully kicked off of their lands during the transition from feudalism to capitalism. The Enclosure Acts gave the aristocracy access to land and a desperate group of people who needed to sell their labor for a wage, many of whom became gardeners and groundskeepers. The lawn was then tied to the colonization of Turtle Island, with wealthy North American settlers using it to claim land and flaunt wealth. Vast areas of forest and native grasslands were raised for settler monoculture agriculture and gardens. The turf grass they brought over is actually highly invasive and has little in common with native perennial grasses. In the 1700s, Thomas Jefferson and other elite Americans copied the landscaping paradigms of rich Europeans, creating expansive lawns accented with expensive non-native plants from European colonies. This set the standard that has dominated our landscaping choices ever since. Well-kept lawns, you see, flaunted wealth. The owner was so wealthy, in fact, that they, but let's face it, he, could waste vast acreage on frivolous turf rather than use it to grow crops to sustain himself and his family. It also boasted wealth and whiteness because slave labor and or large amounts of sheep were required to keep the lawn trimmed before the widespread use of the lawnmower. Now, lawns remain a symbol of class status. Brooks and Francis note that domestic lawns developed in lockstep with the growth of the middle classes and the subsequent global expansion of consumer capitalism. During the post-World War II consumer boom, the chemical industry was facing declining profit margins and quickly capitalized on the expansion of suburban single-family housing. The lawn was central to the suburban transition, as the urban middle classes wanted to escape what they viewed as polluted cities, and racist urban white middle class residents wanted less diverse neighborhoods. As lawns became tied with property values for this population, and as the vast and coercive lawn care economy reached an increasing number of homeowners through commercials and advertisements, the lawn soon came to embody a moral character. Good lawns contain dense, soft grasses with no weeds, maintain a rich and vibrant color, and are neat and consistent. Grass should be manicured and homogenous. Brooks and Francis note that these characteristics are associated with wealth, education, and implicit moral worth. Good neighbors have good lawns. And domestic lawns are very public private spaces. Although lawns may represent a deliberate construction of a relationship with nature, conformity of this relationship is the norm. There are countless stories of people being harassed by their neighbors for lowering the neighborhood's property values should they attempt to create generative native gardens. In one noteworthy case in Ohio, a woman's neighbors trespassed on her property to mow her front and back lawn and pull up the saplings there after she attempted to restore the forest in her backyard. That's right, her backyard. They also took her to civil court for lowering property values and demanded the court enforce the six-inch maximum lawn height mandated by municipal law. This stands in an interesting tension with Americans' obsession with private property rights. You can do whatever you want with your property, except anything that could interfere with the use of property as a financial asset. There's a lot to be said about the colonial concept that individuals can own land and privatize the shared gifts of nature, but setting that aside, a chilling example of the obstinance of homeowners defending their right to treat their property with the utmost disregard for the life that it hosts is the case of the golden-cheeked warbler. Development in central Texas in the 80s decimated its habitat, placing it on the endangered species list. To ensure they would not be restricted in any way by the Endangered Species Act, 
private property owners cut down the oak juniper scrub that the warbler required. Today, the long-term prospects of the bird look grim. The moral lawn economy is so powerful that an increasing number of homeowners are carpeting their yards with artificial turf. Setting aside the uncomfortable question of how to clean the artificial grass should any animals defecate on it, it's a tad bit bonkers that we've reached a point where plastic grass is what we need to purchase to signal our responsibility to our neighbors. What stage of capitalism is it when people begin carpeting outdoors? But I digress. Even when there is dissent and communities refuse to become lawn people, Lobby groups backed by the lawn care and chemical industries have formed to counter the claims of anti-chemical groups mounting campaigns for pesticide restrictions or regulation. If the peer pressure won't get you, the lobbyists will. With real estate developers accelerating the expansion of urban and suburban sprawl, and the strong moral and political economic incentives to become lawn people, there simply aren't enough parks and protected areas or wild native spaces to support thriving biodiversity populations, especially as there is little connectivity between them. With the advance of climate change, species taking refuge in protected areas will need to migrate to cooler temperature zones, but paved cities and inhospitable urban and suburban environments will prevent them from doing so. Entomologist Doug Tallamy explains that habitat fragmentation makes large species populations smaller and isolated from one another, making them more vulnerable to local extinction. Species with large ranges will disappear from small fragmented patches of habitat immediately, and others often eventually disappear as their population sizes are no longer large enough to weather environmental or population fluctuations. Migrating species like the monarch need access to generative landscapes over vast distances. The steady reduction in the native plants they depend on for survival, milkweeds, asters, and goldenrods, have reduced their numbers by 96% since the 1970s. The overwintering population in 2013 was estimated at just 3.6% of the population in 1976. Given that the majority of land in the lower 48 states and along the border of Canada and the U.S. is privately owned and dominated by turf grass, we're facing an uphill battle to recultivate native plant communities and regenerate biodiversity. Under this colonial capitalist system, it'll depend on the good graces of private property owners to change their ways. More likely, it will depend on our ability to organize and demand change. Plants allow animals to ingest the energy shining down on us from the sun. They store this energy through photosynthesis in simple sugars and carbohydrates, and this serves as the basis for every terrestrial and most aquatic food webs on Earth. Animals can access this energy only if they can eat plants or eat something that can eat plants. Entomologist Doug Tallamy again explains that insects are the best at transferring energy from plants to other animals, who then transfer it to other animals still, and, unfortunately, most insects are very picky eaters. Specialized relationships between plants and animals are far more common than generalized relationships, so insect specialists are more common than generalists. In fact, 90% of insect herbivores are restricted to eating one or just a few plant lineages that they co-evolved with over eons. Plants defend themselves against predators by making gross-tasting chemicals, including cyanide and tannins, among others, and storing them in tissues like leaves. Caterpillars are some of the most important insect herbivores, not only because they become pollinators, but because they are the most vital food source for birds. Birds are important for propagating more plant species as they spread seeds throughout the environment and they are also prey for other species in each web. A 2018 study comparing ecosystem sites with mostly native plants versus introduced and invasive plants found that the sites dominated by non-native plants contain 68 fewer caterpillar species, 91% fewer caterpillars, and 96% less caterpillar biomass. That's a whole lot less food for all the species that depend on caterpillars. Although birds also eat berries and seeds, caterpillars are the mainstay of most birds' diets in North America and are vital to their reproduction. And the amount of caterpillars that birds need to raise just one clutch of nestlings is astronomical. A typical nestling eats a full meal 30 to 40 times per day. 
Field researchers have counted several species bringing food to the nest over 800 times per day for days in a row. Sapsuckers feed their nestlings 4,260 times, downy woodpeckers 4,095 times, and hairy woodpeckers 2,325 times. Over the course of their 16-day nesting period, one pair of chickadee parents delivered 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. They then continued to feed their young for up to 21 days. Maintaining landscapes with an abundance of multiple species of birds would therefore require a pretty unthinkable number of caterpillars, but this was the norm when our landscapes were populated with plants that the caterpillars had co-evolved with. Further, although birds will eat berries from non-native plants, these berries tend to have much less fat than their indigenous counterparts. Many North American species of birds need berries with high fat content to build up enough fat stores for migration or to weather the winter months. So while many introduced plants can function to some extent in new ecosystems, the amount of time it would take for adaptations to occur that would allow them to support even a fraction of the local biodiversity that native plants do is many millions of years longer than we have to spare. We need to be ensuring that a majority of our landscapes are full of plants that can support thriving local wildlife communities, not the dwindling minority we have now. One major hurdle is that the colonial capitalists have dubbed most of our generative native plants as weeds. Now, a weed is just a plant that is considered out of place in a given landscape. Doug Tallamy notes that to an ecologist concerned with supporting biodiversity, most introduced ornamentals might be considered weeds. But to many homeowners and gardeners, anything outside of the planned aesthetic design is a weed. And what is aesthetic is still deeply shaped by the tastes of the colonial capitalist elite. When colonizers came to Turtle Island, they imposed European farming techniques, planting unhealthy monocultures and weeding out all other plants. In many cases, the word weed became part of the name of the plants they were exterminating, no matter how ecologically vital they may have been. Milkweeds, for example, are the only plant lineage that can support monarch butterflies. Joe pieweed, horseweed, New York ironweed, ragweed, pigweed, birdweed, smartweed, butterflyweed, hawkweed, tickweed, and fireweed are but more examples. Much like social processes of dehumanization, framing a plant as a weed gives us all the ethical license to kill and remove them for the perceived good of the rest of the garden. Goldenrods, for example, are one of the best group of plants for native bee species and also host 181 species of caterpillars that feed breeding birds. They also produce seeds for birds and voles and mice that feed hawks, owls, weasels, coyotes, and foxes. But they are seen as unattractive, bothersome weeds. I work part-time as a gardener landscaper, and following the wishes of homeowners, my boss and I have personally removed hundreds of goldenrods from the soils around Toronto. My boss does try to inform people about the importance of native plants, but ultimately feels the need to go with their wishes. The more I learn, the worse it feels, guys. It feels bad, let me tell you. Feels real, real bad. Along with my plea to kill your lawn, I'll add a plea to leave your leaves. I'm absolutely heartbroken every fall seeing bags and bags of raked up leaves waiting to be picked up by city disposal. We do this because it's apparently unsightly, but leaving your leaves and other standing dead plant matter is one of the most valuable things you can do to support pollinators and other invertebrates, along with reducing the disproportionate amount of lawn in the landscape. Unlike monarchs who migrate, the majority of butterflies and moths overwinter in the ground cover that leaf litter provides. Most caterpillars crawl off their host plant before moving to the pupal stage. There might be an oak tree in your yard that could feed hundreds of caterpillars, but if it's surrounded by mowed lawns stripped of all fallen leaves, the caterpillars will find no ground cover in which to spin their cocoons. Bees also rely on leaf litter for protection. Most bumblebee queens rest just below the ground or under piles of brush in the winter. Leaves create a natural mulch that helps to suppress weeds while fertilizing the soil as it breaks down. The leaves also serve as a habitat for wildlife, including lizards, birds, turtles, frogs, and insects that overwinter in the fallen leaves. These creatures can help increase pollination of your garden. 
And if we didn't have so much space dedicated to mowed grass, we wouldn't feel the need to rake up in the first place. Save yourself the trouble and save some pollinators while you're at it. The manicured turf grass and the few ornamentals that dominate most of our yards are remnants of a deeply arrogant and misguided colonial ideology that is quickly undermining our ecosystem's abilities to support much life at all. The crisis with our pollinators alone should remind us that we too are part of our ecosystems and can't survive if all other life perishes. The tough thing, as I mentioned, is that private land dominates in this late capitalist hellscape. Let's not mince words. Many have argued that the current housing and property market has increasing parallels with the feudal era, so I expect that most people watching this video are renters and not homeowners themselves. If you are a homeowner with any size of yard, you can start replacing your lawn with native plant communities today. But if not, we'll have to organize and get creative to influence landlords, commercial property owners, and municipal policymakers to make our urban and suburban environments as hospitable to other species as possible. My friend and colleague Becky Ellis terms these potential spaces multi-species urban commons. Tenants unions may be able to make headway with landlords, and local education campaigns and organizing efforts could persuade owners and politicians. We can also organize to reclaim abandoned sites and rewild them, create community gardens, and engage in some good old-fashioned guerrilla gardening. Start where you are, get familiar with the plant species important for biodiversity in your area, and even working with a small deck or balcony garden could help vulnerable insect species that can have cascading effects across the ecosystem. Imagine the connectivity we could create throughout our urban and suburban environments for all kinds of thriving food webs as we work our way up to that decolonized, post-capitalist, solar punk dream. Thank you to my patrons who make these videos possible. Please share this video with anyone you think it might inspire. And if you'd like to contribute to my work, please join me at patreon.com slash mexi and get on the Discord where we have bi-monthly community chats. Thanks all, and I will see you in my next video.